This time it's five motorcycle fails, part two. Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. In life, as in motorcycling, failure is always an option. Here are five great examples where a company has invested heavily in the design and yet not achieved the hoped for sales. It seems the road to hell is indeed paved with good intentions and a lot of cash. The Kawasaki 750 Mach 4. There's no doubt about it, Kawasaki's two strokes of the 1970s are truly a great conundrum. They're the only machines that will feature in everybody's best and worst five motorcycles of the 1970s. And that's true for some particularly good reasons. The performance of that three cylinder two stroke engine absolutely blew people away in the early 70s. Although perhaps it shouldn't have done because it really wasn't actually much quicker than an earlier Norton Commando from 1967 in terms of acceleration through the quarter mile. Nevertheless, this was a really quick bike. The problem was the suspension and the chassis all round simply wasn't up to the job and the bike was often nicknamed the Widowmaker, somewhat unironically. Nevertheless, the bike did enjoy pretty good sales figures, perhaps boosted by that uh, killer reputation. These days, putting modern suspension units on the bike can transform the handling somewhat, although it's never going to be fantastic. Unlike the engine and that mighty two-stroke exhaust note. The Aprilia Moto 6.5. The Moto 6.5 is indeed a bike that truly does divide opinion. It's the result of a collaboration between Aprilia, of course, and French designer Philip Starr. Some would say that the design was a roaring success, with those looping curves in the frame and the engine and the tank. It all looks very organic, very arty. In fact, in the eyes of most bike buyers, it just looked plain odd. And as we know historically with bike buyers all around the world, if something looks odd, they tend to walk away. The underpinnings of the bike were fairly straightforward, actually. It used the 43 horsepower single cylinder 650 motor, which you find in the Pillars Pegaso, and in a very similar form in BMW's F650. The bike was very futuristic in styling, so much so in fact that it even appears in a couple of sci-fi movies, including Bicentennial Man, which starred Robin Williams. To ride it was fairly conventional, but despite this, the bike simply didn't take off. People just didn't like the quirky styling, and at that time of course, single cylinder bikes were very much on the way out. It was all about multis. Perhaps had the bike been on sale Today it may have been more successful, particularly in the A2 market category. But alas, the bike never really sold in anything like the numbers the company was hoping for. So despite its clever, arty design, the bike unfortunately makes it to our list of five. The Harley Davidson XR1200. Harley's original XR750 of the 1960s and 70s was, as any American will tell you, a truly great race bike, used on dirt track and was also used for jumping over buses by one Evil Knievel, or not jumping over buses on a couple of occasions, it must be said. Nevertheless, this was a road-burning race machine. But for some reason, AMF, who then owned Harley-Davidson, simply didn't bother to produce a replica. And in fact, it wasn't until 2008 that we finally saw a replica. The XR1200 appeared as the Buell name was kicked into touch and was, notionally at least, a high performance Harley Davidson. They were trying to break away from their cruiser image and create what today would be a dirt track race replica. Seems like another American company has had some success building that recently. Unfortunately, this was not the case of Harley Davidson. They gave the bike daring styling, quite a few chassis tweaks, much better suspension all round than the standard cruisers, better brakes and a tweaked engine which gave a bit more performance. So if you're looking for a performance sportster, this is definitely going to be the bike to go for, and there's an absolute hoot to ride. Unfortunately, it wasn't a success. Sales in Europe were 
fairly promising. They did run some one-make bike race series in Britain and other places in Europe, and this did help boost sales a little. But overall, Harley were completely dissatisfied with the sales performance of the machine. The bike did vibrate a little bit more than the standard bikes, mainly due to the fact that it revved higher to get that extra performance. But I think the main reason it failed is that people had expectations about Harleys, because Harley riders expected a cruiser, and sports bike riders just didn't see it as sporty enough. So the bike failed. It seems like so many times before, this may be a case of the right bike, but just a few years too early. Motor Goodies Quota. Those of us who have been fans of Goodsy for a long time will tell you that the 850TT is most definitely not Goodsy's first attempt at an off road adventure style motorcycle. The Quota, for example, wasn't their first either, but was probably their first really large capacity one. To develop the bike, they introduced an all new chassis with redesigned airbox and intakes, bold new styling, and of course, completely new cycle parts, and was one of the earliest Goodsy's to actually employ a single rear shock. The problem was Goodsy really didn't have the money to develop a bike of this nature. So what we got in effect was a big, very tall adventure bike, which was running on what was essentially a Goodsy California engine. So performance wasn't exactly startling. So in many ways the machine really did lack that refinement and development that say a BMW GS had at the time. Not surprisingly, the bike wasn't a great sales success. Mainly because if you wanted a bike to cruise on and you wanted a Goodsy, you could simply go out and buy a California, which at least would have a lower seat height. The bike makes a great tourer, rather like many large adventure bikes today, and there's a great mile much on the motorway. But the way that people saw it back then, an awful lot of bikes are great on the motorway, and they don't cost quite as much as the quota. The styling didn't really hit a note either, it just looked a little bit too plain. Unfortunately, the bike didn't sell and didn't really find an audience. It seemed that everybody was going to be buying GSs from now on. The Honda DN01. The DN01 is the latest in Honda's attempts to create a bike for every man, a sort of two wheeled car, if you will. Honda have tried this game a few times before, of course, with bikes like the PC800. And indeed, the engine and a lot of the parts on this bike and general concept bear a considerable resemblance to the PC800 itself. But if anything, the cruiser style of this machine only goes to make the bike look even more scooter-like. And as we know, a lot of motorcyclists can't abide scooters, and simply looking like a scooter can be enough to dampen sales. As a general concept and as an overall design, of course it's great at what it's designed to do, fairly typical Honda. So if you want to cruise great distances, this could be a great choice for you. The seat height's also low, so it's a very accessible machine. Unfortunately, it's the styling that kills this machine off although it's not held by what is fairly modest performance by modern standards. It seems like Honda are making the same mistakes they did with the PC800, although, of course, it's all a matter of opinion. I expect the people that like this bike really like this bike, because if you just want a bike that does a job, this thing will do it really well. However, if the job that you want it to do is high cornering, high speed excitement, this may not be it. It also, like so many Hondas these days, lacks a bit of character. It's that car-like thing again. Still, it's an interesting design, and if you just want to buy it to get you around, it could be a good choice. But unfortunately, not many people felt that way, and the Honda performed disappointingly, not unlike the PC800 before it. Let's hope Honda keep trying. These are brave efforts, and let's hope at some point they'll strike success and finally drag some people out of their cars and onto motorcycles, and we'll get a few more fellow bikers on the road. And whether you like the Stalin or not, if the bike succeeds in doing that, that can never be a bad thing, can it? Well, I hope you enjoyed our little selection of oddities. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.